Okay, so let's get started. It's 6.30 Eastern Time. And uh, again, my name is Mitch Weisberg. And I'm here with Ed for EdChat Interactive. And um, you know, my purpose is to uh, give you a little bit of a taste for the Shindig platform and then to introduce Russ and Mickey. Let me bring up Russ. And there he is. Russ, how are you doing? Can you hear me? I'm doing well, Mitch. Thank you. So, I can. so can you hear me okay? So, yeah, I can hear you great. So, um, what's this about the Dodgers? Shouldn't you be, shouldn't you be wearing a Mets t-shirt? Well, can you know, can everybody see that? Well, the truth of the matter but... is, those that know me, oh. <laughs> um, well, those that know me realize it should be a Red Sox shirt, but I am actually here in LA. Um, I am sitting in the office of Dr. David Baca, who is the administrator of instruction here at LA Unified um, in the East District. And so I just finished up working with um, a group of administrators and teachers here in LA two minutes ago because it's only 3.30 out here. And here I am, and being the good guy that I am, boom, Dodgers. Well, well that, that is the ultimate, day. the ultimate sacrifice. The only thing is, if you were in New York, would you wear a Yankees? T-shirt? Would you go that far? Well, yes. If, yes. Wow. If you paid, yeah, of course, okay. if you paid me as much as LA Unified, of course I would. No, <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I, I got to tell you, uh, <laughs> yeah, um, I, I, I actually love it. I really do. They are, um, the, the staff is amazing. The people are cool, and it's been one of the better, best experiences I've had, quite frankly, working in school. So. I feel incredibly fortunate to be here. So fortunate. I even have an away jersey that I'm wearing tomorrow's session. So. Wow. Okay. So do you want me to bring Mickey up? Do you want me to bring what, what, uh, your slides up? What would you like me to bring up next with you? Yeah. Why don't you bring Mickey up now? That would be great. Okay. Uh, Mickey, can you click on the raise hand button so I can find you? I thought, I thought since, we were, uh, since we were doing baseball, it's uh, – we might as well go all out here. Hey, Russ. <laughs> this is actually quite sad. So just for people that are tuning in, this is, our, our goal is to be the first content-free uh, webinar you've had through Corwin. And, uh, <laughs> and, and the good news of that is they will not ask us to do it again. So, right. the, <laughs> um, so for... <laughs> First, let me let me jump in then and kind of kick this whole thing going. First and, and foremost, thank I want to thank Mitch. Um, I am not a fan of webinars. I think I'll just get that right out there. But I got to tell you, every single one we've done we've done with with Shindig has been great. I mean, it I love it. I mean, it, if I have to do them, I I won't do them unless I do them with uh, Mitch and his operation. So I appreciate Mitch what you've done to this whole webinar mentality out there. And obviously, thank Corwin for allowing us the opportunity to do this. It's a little different than what Mick and I originally expected. Our our plan was to end up doing this in Portland, Maine, together at our office uh, up in Maine. But as would have it, Mickey is just flying back from Atlanta doing something at ASCD and just got home into um, into um, Boston area. And I just flew out to LAUSD. And so this this is obviously where I am. So. We're going to do the very best we can and tag team this, but I am so incredibly happy that Mickey is on doing this with me. Um, as everyone knows, he's the co-author of the Student Voice book and has um, is, is obviously taken this work to another whole level. So we're going to kind of tag team this a little bit today. And um, without any further ado, if we can just jump in. Um, we, as I understand, I can't have slides in Mickey at the moment, so I'm going to jump back into the slides. And let's run through some slides, and I'll bring Mickey up when we get to self-worth, if that's okay. Mitch, does that make sense to you? Perfect. Great. Um, well, and there's our first slide. It's an impressive slide. Um, I, I want people to ask questions, and if we're um, going too fast or something doesn't sink in until later, please use our Twitter accounts. Um, I know Mickey's great at getting back on his. I am medium getting back at mine. I will try to get better. Uh, but I'll even give you my direct email because that I am good at. It's Qualia, my last name, uh, at Q, 
qisa.org, qisa.org, and that's my direct email, so please feel free to email with questions or comments afterwards or thoughts that you might have. All right, let's just jump, let's jump right in and see what's going on, but before we do, I think what's critically important is for people to understand what our fundamental beliefs are. I, I've even sat in on too many webinars and, and all sorts of things on YouTube and hear people yell, blah, 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 blah. And I don't even know what they stand up for, what they believe in value. And I think it's incredibly important that you understand where not just Mickey and I are coming from, but the entire the entire staff um, at the Institute. And that I guess our number one thing, and this has not been a new phenomenon for us, is that students have the potential, they're not the problem. Um, and the reason I believe that and the staff believes that and we live by that is because we believe students have something to teach us. It's an interesting thing to talk about student voice and to, to move on student voice because of this whole notion of we, we talk about the importance of voice, but does it matter if students have a voice if we're not willing to listen? Does it matter if students have a voice um, if we don't think they have something to teach us? And so we've gone back to this whole fundamental thought is, yeah, voice is great, but it doesn't matter if we don't believe they have something to teach us. So one of our fundamental beliefs as Students are the potential, not the problem. It's students have something to teach us. And the third fundamental belief, and this is, I want to be super clear about this. I don't want to put this on here. So I think it's a cute thing to put on there because some book thinks, you know, it's like the thing to do about working together. I put it on there because I believe it. Um, and I, quite frankly, I didn't believe it early in my career. Um, I thought I'd have this revolution by now where working with students and because of their beliefs and values and numbers, quite frankly, is that. I don't care if teachers bought into this or administrators, quite frankly, if we we're going to do it with students. Come to the realization that was, that was incredibly naive. It wasn't pretty naive. It was incredibly naive. And what we've learned is that we're all in this together. And what I love about the work where it's evolved is we've gone from student voice to teacher voice to principal voice, somewhere down the road, maybe parent voice, but certainly student voice, teacher voice, and principal voice. Because what we've learned is this the schools that have in practice, student voice are the same places that have strong teacher voice. And what we've come to the realization is um, asking teachers and working with teachers to allow students to have voice made absolutely no sense to them unless they believed they had a voice. So it's asking somebody to do something where they weren't even practicing themselves. So anyway, that's a long way of getting into that is who we are and what we're about. And what we're going to do is something that's incredibly humbling is share our work with you from our book um, in about 30 minutes, which makes you wonder why the book is 200 pages long when obviously it could only have to be 10 pages long. But it is a couple hundred pages long, and we're going to give you the expedited um, overview of what's going on with the understanding there's a lot more deeper learning that, that is certainly made available, not just with us, but through Corwin and Mitch and his webinars and so on. So let's jump into this school voice model. One of the interesting things about the school voice book, um, in the student voice book in particular, is that we were not spending uh, the time we probably should have developing that definition of student voice. It, it's in there, but it's kind of, I don't know, it's in there sort of tangentially. Um, not as an afterthought, but we didn't realize the importance of defining what voice really meant. And for us, there's three major principles in there. The first one is listen, which is somewhat common to what you think voice is. The second one is learn. And the third one is lead. And when we talk about those things, here's the important construct around voice. And this isn't just student voice, but it's about teach voice, it's about principal voice, is that the first piece of this thing is being able to listen. Now, some people think listening is a passive activity. And what we tell people, no, that, that's an action item. You need to seek out um, to hear people. Typically, when we think we're listening to someone, we're usually listening to somebody that has our ear or someone that we're comfortable talking to. But when we talk about voice and the importance before you have a voice that you need to listen, you need to actively seek out different people's opinions. Um, I hear all the time, and matter of fact, I'm in an office now, in, in central office, that, that has an open door policy, and I, I think that's a dandy thing to have, except it doesn't matter if you have an open door policy if no one's going through it. Um, what I tell administrators is have an open door policy, but that means two things. One is that people are willing to come into it, and more importantly is that you're willing to go out of it. And when you go out of it is that you're seeking out and listening to others. So once we listen to people, and some people do this, some schools do this by thinking they're good because they offer a survey, and the surveys aren't the worst thing in the world. 
Um, but it's not the end all be all. It's getting that information from an instrument, whether it's the student voice survey or somebody else's survey. It, that's neither here nor there, quite frankly. But getting information and then being willing to learn from it. Um, and that learning piece is about being able to understand what you're being told. Um, so again, it's listening, being active, getting information in, making sure you're willing to learn from it in the sense that I'm going to take the time to understand what I'm hearing. Um, and making sure that what I'm hearing, I can make sense of it, or you can help me understand it. And then, then it's leading. Uh, it's taking action. It's taking action with our voice. It's taking action with our feet. What happens when you look at that model, what happens a lot is that we listen, we skip learning, and we go to leading. We take a survey. We get the survey data back. We make a decision. This is what we're going to do. Like, wow, we have to do something. This is like, whoa. Rather than saying, let's, let's get this information. Let's really understand what this information is telling us. What don't I understand and why don't I understand it? Why are kids telling us what they're telling us? Why are teachers saying what they're saying? And then move on to action. So, Mitch, if we can sign up those next few slides, it, it speaks to the seek out, the understand and respect, and then ultimately about taking action with others. So you're seeking out opinions from others, you're understanding and respecting people, and then you take in action. Here is the dynamic of this model. It happens between listening and learning. Remember, listening, seeking out information. The connection between listening and learning is where we believe is where you build trust. It is impossible to lead with your voice if people don't trust what you're saying. It's impossible to have people trust what you're saying unless they think you're willing to listen to them and above all willing to learn from them. And then ultimately, it's about this whole notion of accepting responsibility. Um, it's about trust. Uh, it's about responsibility, and our educational system right now is driven by this notion of testing and accountability, where we believe it needs to be driven by trust and responsibility. And the difference being there around voice is this. If my voice, if I'm held accountable regarding my voice, it means I'm accountable to somebody else. When I'm held responsible for what I say and how I say it and who I say it to and what I do with those words, I become responsible to myself. And that's a big difference when it comes to voice. Voice is not just about sharing opinions. Um, voice, quite frankly, isn't about just sharing ideas. Yeah, those are two major components. Well, to me, voice is about accepting responsibility for what I say, for what I believe ha needs to happen next, and accepting that responsibility and doing something about that. So the notion of student voice, teacher voice, principal voice, who's ever voice in schools, it seems relatively simple. Um, except when you really kind of uh, dissect it, it's incredibly complicated and complex. And it's because we've taken the time to listen, I believe, lead, learn, and ultimately lead, is where we ended up with our three guiding principles around aspirations. And the notion of aspirations is not just about being a big dreamer, but being able to dream and set goals for the future, which is critical. But you need to be inspired in the present to get there. If not, dreamers are a dime a dozen. Um, it is easy to say, oh, I, I guess I'll do this, whatever. It's what am I doing now in the present to get there? And we didn't learn that because we made this up in the shower. We learned that because we were willing to listen and learn from a lot of different kids in a lot of different situations. And what we learned is that when they think about their aspirations, it's not about telling adults what they want to be. Um, it's really telling us about who they want to become and most importantly, why. So let me bring up Mick. Um, and Mick, you want to walk through the dreaming and doing constructs? Oh, I'm supposed to raise my hand. Sorry, sorry, Mitch, forgot to raise my hand. Um, yeah, let me do that. And then I think, Russ, I, after, right after that, I want to ask people to um, to get with a partner and take advantage of the shindig uh, thing where people can talk to each other. Um, just brief Perfect. so that we can uh, get, get people interacting. So. Um, so there's two parts, right, that Russ talked about the definition. There's the dreaming part, the future-oriented part, common sense uh, way that most people understand what aspirations are. Um, but until you add that doing part, that present part, there's that, that idea that aspirations are things I'm working on right now, um, they, they're just pipe dreams. They're just, uh, you know, kind of pie in the sky, buy and buy stuff. Um, so it's critical that dreaming and doing uh, are partners to one another. And are another then that idea of students students aspirations are another source 
of student voice because if the goal of school is to raise students' aspirations, to, to help students dream about it and inspire them in the present to get there, if that's the goal, right? <laughs> the goal isn't to raise standardized test scores as high as possible. So if that's the goal, then I absolutely need student voice. I need to listen. Um, I need to learn from the students what their uh, aspirations are, what in inspires them in the present to reach their aspirations. And then ultimately, I want to lead with them. I want to help them lead their lives, lead responsible lives, lives responsible to the aspirations they set for themselves. So that's one way to think about the, the notion of aspirations that that we're talking about here and the model, um, the student voice model that Russ just shared about listening, learning, and leading. So when we've listened and learned, uh, we've learned that kids are, there are some kids that are low dreaming and low doing. We, we call that category hibernation. There are kids that are kind of sleepwalking their way through school, if not life. Um, there are some kids that are high dreaming and low doing. Um, they have big ideas, big plans. They're kind of fun to talk to, to tell you exactly what you want to hear about their futures. Um, but they're not doing anything, especially uh, in the present, to reach those dreams. You probably all talk to those kids who uh, are going to play in the NFL or they're going to be the next American Idol. Um, they're going to be millionaires by the time they're 30. And it's all great. It's all go for it, you know. But what are you doing right now to get there? A lot of kids we talk to, high doing, low dreaming. They're working really hard in school. They're, they're paying attention in class. They're doing everyone's telling them to do. They don't get in trouble. Um, a lot of kids who uh, we talk to who are in alt schools, actually, once they find that, here's a group of teachers who can help them and support them. They work really hard. Um, but when you ask them about what's the point of all this, um, some of them will get to some vague thing about college. They're not sure why. Uh, that sounds like the goal of school is more school to them, and that doesn't make sense. But um, nothing wrong with going to college, but the goal of all school, K through 16 or 18 or 21, or however long you want to stay in school, is life, right? That's the goal. Uh, and so um, high doing and low dreaming also is not a recipe for success. Uh, this conference we did in a a ASCD um, on Friday, somebody said, uh, yeah, you, you figure out, if you do imagination, high dreaming, low doing, you figure out in your 20s that that's probably not going to work. Um, in, in if you're high doing and low dreaming, you've worked really hard your whole life, but haven't connected it to your own dream, um, you figure that out in your 30s when you're living someone else's life. And so I never, this is nothing, nothing I wanted to do with my life. Why am I doing this? Um, aspirations is the goal. So high dreaming, high doing. We want every kid, and we believe every school can have every single student in their school. Um, not attached to uh, economics or race or gender or anything like that. Every kid in your school can be dreaming about their futures and inspired in the present to be working on them right now. Um, and so that's that's our model. That's our framework. And again, you absolutely need to listen, learn, and lead with students in order to get there. Um, part of Part of what's holding kids in the hibernation, perspiration, or imagination category is that you're missing pieces of that model. Kids are not being listened to, they're not being learned from, and, and there's no sense of leadership for their own lives. And so they're just kind of drifting around. Um, so let me, Mitch, let's, let's invite people to get into groups. Um, I think Mitch taught you how that works. You just kind of click on a couple, three other people. And I invite you to talk about one of two things. Um, the listen, learn, lead model, you can even very specifically share with each other something you learn, learn from a student. Okay, I guess I brought you up too soon, right? No, it's all good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, you're up. Do you, know, you want the slides back up? or what, what did you guys talk about when you were in your group? Yeah, why don't we bring Mick, can you bring Mick back up, Mitch, too? Because I think that would be sure, great. Sure, and then, sure. Not that I want to get rid One of you. Well, that's okay. I'm supposed to be in the background anyhow. Oh, they, they knocked me out. Oh, Mick, you're back in, Mick. Okay, I'm back. They pulled me up. Okay, I was, hey, Russ, I was talking to Bob Sampson. I don't know if you saw him in here. Um, no, I didn't. That's uh, awesome. Hi, Bob. <laughs> yeah, Bob's, Bob, everybody else, Bob's an old friend from when we used to do work in New Hampshire, uh, White Mountain Regional High School, and then that work in that school and a few others turned into a national um, 
uh, a statewide uh, adventure in New Hampshire called Follow the Child. So yeah, it's good. I was just talking about. That's awesome. Um, other insights other than Bob around that last discussion, everybody wants to share. Do you want to do that at the end? Uh, no, it'd be great. Maybe if people could pop into the chat window what they heard someone else say. I'm always interested what people learn, how they're filtering, uh, what they're hearing from other people. So what, what did you hear your colleague there who you've never met before maybe say about uh, the Listen, Learn, Lead model or um, our model for student voice or for that matter, the relationship between the two of them. So pop that in, I think, while we continue us the next part of the uh, slides. Great, all right. So Mitch, if you would bring up the slides back in and I'll, I'll slide in this quickly. Um, I'm sure this is going incredibly fast for most people out there. Uh, <laughs> um, so what I wanna do is this, let me kind of get through the, and get through is not, really the most positive way to put this. Let me go over the student self-worth engagement and purpose construct. Um, and I wanna put this in, in a piece for you to kind of wrap your heads around here. So we've got voice, which really drove our work. And through voice, we kind of, if I guess for lack of a better word, developed this quadrant to either better understand it, better explain it. And for our purposes, actually to better research it around imagination, hibernation, um, and so on, perspiration and, and ultimately aspiration. So let's let's look at some student voice data, if you would. I think that's on the next slide. Um, when we talk around student voice, here's the interesting p component around student voice. You can put all that data up there, if you would, Mitch. I think it's three of them. Perfect. Uh, thank you. The a couple of things about student voice. You just want to say, and this is a, the overview of overviews, is that student voice in school, although we might think it should be, it's not a natural a natural way of being. Um, it exists in some places, but having a kid raise their hand, give you an answer on a test, or raise in their hand because they're asking you a question in class, those, those are not bad things, but it doesn't represent voice. Voice is about being able and willing to say what I'm thinking, to say what an idea I have, to give you a, a suggestion, not just a question, why are we doing it this way, but not being afraid to express why not do it a different way. The interesting thing that we've learned around student voice, and this is almost counterintuitive to what we're, where the direction started from, is the notion of everyone needs to have a voice. And, and we still believe everyone needs to have a voice, including students, teachers, and principals, and I guess parents sometimes. Um, that was an editorial. The, um, but the notion is this, not all students are ready to have a voice. It, it's not that they don't want a voice, is they don't know how to express it yet. And so the a piece that Lisa Landy and I are writing about, or have written about in the new Teacher Voice book is this, the issue of teacher willingness and organizational readiness. And the same applies for students. It's students' willingness and ability to express their voice, but it's also the organizational readiness so they prepare to hear a voice. The data we've collected from I don't know, 10, 15, 20 years now, I guess, um, is get set. Can you take that seven times off for a second, Mitch, just for a second, because that was actually the closer that I was building up to, but obviously you've seen it. Uh, no, is when you look at some of this data, you got 47% of the students say they have a voice in decision making. So quite frankly, we're not doing a great job on that. But here's the kicker. I wonder why that's so low until I had the next statement up there is, well, it's low because only 52% of the teachers from the kid's perspective, say they're willing to learn from students. So if you're a kid, why would I share my voice if I don't think half the teachers are willing to learn from it? What's interesting about this is 50% of the kids say they know the goals that my school is working on. We talk about kids accepting responsibility, taking responsibility for the school. We talk about the incredible issue of apathy. Well, part of that reason could be students don't think they have a voice. Part of that could be they don't think people will listen to them. And the other part of that is they don't know the goals that the school is working on. It is hard to be an engaged learner, to be non-apathetic when you don't have a voice, don't think anyone's listening, or know the goals of the school. Now, Mitch, here's the close. Are you ready, baby? Boom. Why do people have a voice? Nice job. That was not bad timing. It's because when students do have a voice, they're seven times more likely to be motivated to learn than students that don't have a voice. Now, this is a zillion things we're doing out there around getting kids academically motivated. Um, student voice is a relatively simple thing to do. Um, and 
the reason I share this with you is because student voice isn't a, like a passing thing. It's not like a cute idea that's hit around you know the, the 21st century. Student voice is about making a difference. When students have a voice, they are seven times more likely to be academically motivated than kids without a voice. That, that's a home run for us in education. Um, what drives that even further is the next set around self-worth. Mickey, you want to pick up self-worth? Yeah, I'm quite. Yeah. Okay, yeah, Mark. So this this fits in perfectly with a question that was just asked, Russ. Um, Margarita Marsicall, I'm hoping I'm saying your your name right there. Um, asked, uh, do you think students can have a voice in one class and not another, and how can you get them to have a voice in other classes? Absolutely, because we know that voice is um, also correlated in, in the data with things like self worth. And in particular, in, in light of this question, uh, a student's relationship with his or her teachers. So obviously, if a student has a positive, healthy relationship with a particular teacher, they're much more likely to have a voice in that class with that teacher than they are in a class where the student feels like they're not respected or not trusted, or where, frankly, the teacher has made an unsafe um, environment for voice. You know, where if I, if I speak up in that class, um, because the teacher is not sort of managing the class well, uh, you know, I'm going to get uh, made fun of or, or bullied even by another student. So when we look at the self-worth data, we, we can start to think about the context, the classroom and school context, uh, which is safe to have a voice in. So we see 46% of students feel I am a valued member of my school community. Uh, if I feel valued, probably I'm going to have a voice. And it, that's reciprocal, right? The more I'm asked to contribute, to have a voice, to make decisions, to be part of what we're doing here at the school, um, the more valued I'm going to feel, and the more valued I feel, the more likely I am to have a voice. Um, students care, uh, teachers care if I'm absent from school. Uh, uh, this is the one for Russ to talk about, because Ru Russ talks, if, if we were to have a one-statement survey, um, this would be the question. Do teachers even care if you're present in school? Do they even care if you show up? Uh, at this school. And you see half the kids in the country don't believe teachers care if they're even there. So um, when we look at attendance policies uh, and, and approaches to improve attendance, a lot of the things that schools are working on, um, it's a pretty good place to start by sending the message, absolutely sending the message that every teacher in that school cares if kids are missing. Um, and 60% of students say they are proud of their school. I am proud of my school. Um, so those all are factors that we measure when it comes to self-worth, having a positive sense of myself and, and, and valuing myself because I see value in other people. I see people's other value in me. Um, and then the impact of this is five times. So we know that students who have this in their experience of school, they feel self-worth, are five times more likely to be academically motivated and this is our, one of our lowest effect sizes, but it's pretty good. If you know something that will increase students' motivation five-fold, you should do that. Um, and this is, in, in our work, this is one of the things that does it, just simply valuing kids for who they are, accepting them for who they are, respecting them, saying, I'm glad to see you. I hope you're feeling better. Uh, simple things like that make a huge difference, not only to the personal relationship with the kid. That's great, but school's not a day camp. It affects their academic motivation. It affects their willingness to work hard in your class. You don't need a database with a million kids in it to know that. Ask one kid, do they work harder for teachers they believe care about them than teachers they believe don't care about them? And every single kid you ask that question to will say, absolutely. They'll look at you like that was a silly question. So uh, I'll kick it back to Russ for engagement. And, uh, and then maybe, Russ, if you do engagement and purpose and we get people talking one more time, um, we'll be good. OK, engagement. Wow, I just want you all to know I, I miss you all incredibly much while Mickey was talking, but whew, I'm feeling better now. The, uh, so regarding the engagement piece, it just interestingly, um, Dr. Landy and I just did a day session here at LAUSD on engagement, and it was pretty engaging. Um, so how can I tell you what we did in two minutes? So engagement is about recognizing the fact that we're just not up there delivering stuff. Um, information to the student becomes engaging when there's a relationship between the teacher and the student. 
Um, it becomes engaging when there's a level of interest between the student and the content. It becomes engaging when there's a relationship between the content and the teacher, which creates this notion of expertise. Um, so when we look at engagement as a, as a collective entity, it's really this delicate balance between the student, the teacher, and the content, where again, teach a student have some kind of relationship there where they at least have this mutual respect for one another. The connection between the student and the content is their level of interest in the area. It's how to get them engaged in something that they don't care about. Um, and then ultimately the connectedness between the teacher and the content that I not only know the content, but I'd be able to deliver it. Um, and this is why we hire experts um, in the field. And when you have that balance between the teacher, the student, and the content, Kind of this gray area emerges where you know this teaching and learning happening by everyone where it's okay to have fun and excitement in the classroom and by fun and excitement we're not talking about laughing we're talking about being so engaged in something we're losing track of time and space uh, we're talking about engagement where people are curious and creative um, about the life around them we talk about people being engaged because i'm engaged in something not just because i'm not afraid to fail but I'm engaged in something because I'm not afraid to succeed. And those are the challenges that are in front of us now. Of what do we do to create an engaged environment that is really meaningful to the students, that piques their interest, um, gets a connectedness to them, um, and has some value? Um, I hear about rigor relevance all the time, and I'm not against rigor and relevance. Um, I, I'm really into the relevance piece <laughs> because I think that is what is engaging. Um, and we don't want it to be not rigorous because then it becomes boring. So it's really the combination of everything working together. Um, when we look at some of the data pieces, you know, we have 43% of the kids reporting that school is boring. 44% say my classes help me understand what's happening in my everyday life. You look at those two data points alone. The first one we share, we, we hear this, oh, 43% say school is boring. Well, that's not bad. I thought it'd be worse. And I'm like, well, seriously, out of you, are you out of your flipping mind? We're boring half the kids. And, well, I thought it'd be worse. And what, we're not doing anything about it? Um, that number, that is just, that's that that's not a healthy number. Um, boring, 43% of our students is, is not, not good. Uh, it might have been 80% when we were in school, but, you know, seriously, 43% is not great. And I think part of the reason it's not great is because, a lot of kids do not think that classes help them understand anything about their everyday life. What is interesting about that data point is this. In sixth grade, it's around 60%. In some 12th graders, by the time they get to be seniors in particular schools, it could be anywhere from 18% to 25%. So interestingly, the longer kids are in school, the less engaged some of them are becoming. And so we've got to be pretty cognizant of that. Why is engagement important? It's because when students are engaged, Go ahead, Mitch, hit that magic button. 16 times more likely to be motivated to learn. So we've learned that student voice, having a voice, I'm seven times more likely to be academically motivated. If I have a sense of self-worth, I'm five times more likely to be motivated. And this one is pure common sense, quite frankly. If I am engaged in learning, if this is about me, if I know why I'm learning what I'm learning, if I'm curious, if I'm creative, I have a spirit of adventure, not afraid to fail, not afraid to succeed, boom. I'm 16 times more likely to be motivated to learn. Next, let's move on to purpose before I kick this back to Mickey. Um, we talk about purpose, and this is the third guiding principle. So the first one is about this whole notion of self-worth. The second one is around per I mean around engagement. And the third dimension is around purpose. And purpose, in the simplest terms, and this is incredibly complicated, and there's a lot of stuff written about this. Um, but purpose in and of itself is moving away from asking kids what they want to be because it's kind of an inane question. It's, just, it's, it's, it's an insane question to ask. It's, it's asinine, quite frankly. I'm asking a kid what they want to be, and they're going to change 87 times. Instead, we're suggesting ask kids who they want to become, not as a person, but not as like another kind of person. But what am I about? Uh, what do I stand up for? What gets me up in the morning? What motivates me? Uh, I'm more concerned about who people are rather than what they do. Um, and that's this whole notion of purpose. It's thinking beyond self. It's understanding that I can make a difference in this world. It's understanding that people know my hopes and dreams, that I can make a difference, I will make a difference, and what I do matters. 
what I do really matters. But again, it's moving beyond this notion of what do I want to be, but rather moving to the construct of who do I want to become? I want to be a creator. Do I want to be an inventor. Do I want to work in an area that helps others um, and those kinds of things. And it makes for a much richer conversation, quite frankly. Um, when you talk to kids around purpose, uh, the vast majority, the vast majority believe they can be successful. Here is the kick is not so much around teachers believing in them. I, I get to travel, as many people know that are on this. Um, I, I travel a lot, I mean, in fact, way too much, quite frankly. And wherever I go out of this country, uh, they'll ask me, um, what do I think the biggest issue is in education? <laughs> Except recently, now they're asking me, how the hell is Trump where he is? But that's another story, and we'll do a webinar on that maybe someday. Um, but the question about education is, what do I think the biggest educational issue is? And they want me to talk about standards and testing and all those finances and all those things. And I say, no, no, I think the biggest issue in our American education is this expectation gap. And that expectation gap is that teachers have lower expectations of the kids than the kids do of themselves. That's a problem. And that's not all teachers, obviously. But I think that's a huge issue. Um, and it's certainly an issue around purpose. We have kids that believe in themselves, but the people around them that are teaching them, and quite frankly, their parents' numbers aren't much better than these, is I don't even believe in my own kids that are going to be successful. So how do we get rid of that expectation gap? One of the ways is looking at that third statement is about understanding kids' hopes and dreams, even knowing kids' hopes and dreams. If you take one thing away from this conversation today over the last 45 minutes or so, I ask you to do this. Is this takeaway is uh, tomorrow I'm going to ask one, two, three, four, five of my kids, what are their hopes and dreams? What, who do they want to become? What matters to them? Um, when they see themselves down the road, what kind of person do they see themselves becoming? And again, it moves away from what do you want to be or what are you going to do, but who do you want to become? Because here is the issue. When students have a sense of purpose, when they understand who they are, when they understand what school is about, Mitch, the magic button is 18. Wow, that was actually pretty good timing. Is 18 times more likely to be motivated, uh, academically motivated to learn. There's nothing out there like that, nothing out there. You look at who I love, you look at the work of, of John Hattie and the others talking about effect sizes and so on. Lots of great things that are moving students. This is one of them. Um, this whole notion of students having a sense of purpose. What is purpose built on? It's built on self-worth, it's built on engagement, and it's built on the notion that they have a voice. They understand who they are, what they're about. And the same issues are true with staff. Um, and we need to ask ourselves, the people on this need to ask themselves, where is your sense of purpose? Who are you? What gets you up in the morning? What gets you motivated to face these kids day after day when, and quite frankly, some days you just might want to stay in bed or take a day off? Who are you and what are you about? It's having that sense of purpose. And then all the work that we've done around, around student voice, teacher voice, and now principal voice is looking at how are we getting kids to have a sense of purpose, to take what we're learning embed it in ourselves so I have a sense of self-worth, that I'm meaningfully engaged in my learning, and then I have a sense of purpose. And the way to get at that from our work, and at least our perspective of what we've learned over the now three decades, spanning over three decades, is allowing kids to have a voice, to let them share what they think, to let them share with you what will be done to make a difference, and ulti ultimately sharing with you what they can do to accept responsibility for that. So, Nick, let me hand off this to you to kind of pull the pieces together, if you would, and see if there's any Q&A out there. Yeah, so that's it. Those four things, I mean, there are other factors that we measure and we look at, um, but those four things that Russ and I shared, student voice, self-worth, engagement, purpose, all have a huge impact on students' academic motivation. Uh, in a minute, I'm going to get you back into a different group. I'm going to ask you to go back into a different group um, and share a best practice from your own experience in any one of those four things. Student voice, developing kids' self-worth, engagement in the classroom. Don already shared in the chat window if you saw uh, a best practice around engagement by involving enterprise uh, or developing purpose in kids and getting to know their hopes and dreams and building what you learn about their hopes and dreams into your curriculum into your classroom practice. 
Um, we hear a lot from kids. Sure, yeah, the teacher handed out the thing in the beginning of the year, yeah, like an index card, and I, but we never heard about it again. So um, just ask, move on to listen, learn, and then lead. And for a classroom teacher, that means shaping classroom instruction based on what you've learned. Um, before I do that, before I put you in groups, let me dust up a couple of questions people have asked in the chat window. Um, people ask about which this sample from. Um, I'm going to put in the chat window a link to uh, our, our national report. So the data we're sharing is from that national report. Um, that particular cohort of kids had 66 some odd thousand kids in it, 230 schools all over the country, various demographics. That's from our 612 survey, students in grade 6. That's the data that we're sharing. We also have surveys for students in grades 3-5, uh, as well as teacher surveys and uh, parent surveys. But this particular dating, data we're sharing today is from that particular um, analysis that we did. Um, someone asked about using social media to get at student voice and some of these things. It's great. It's fantastic. The kids are there. They were there way ahead of us. Uh, the challenge we find there in schools is various uh, district or even state or even federal laws and policies around the use of such technologies. Never mind, uh, you know, are the devices banned in the school or not? But um, you do have to proceed with caution around using platforms like uh, Facebook. If there are any kids still on Facebook, could because the grown-ups have made it uncool. Um, but Snapchat and Twitter and various other things that keep emerging out there, uh, Instagram, um, proceed with caution and be mindful that there are, there may be policies involved there that you have to uh, work around or, or work with, I should say, not around that idea. Um, so let me get you back uh, sharing concrete, practical, best practices. I know people in this uh, ed chat have seen uh, the best way to do student voice in a classroom or a school, the best way to develop kids' self worth. You have ideas, you've seen it, you've heard about it, you've read an article. So get with a person you didn't get with previously, two or three, um, and share those best practices. I'm going to ask you the same question when we come back. What did you learn? I'm going to ask you to pop that into the window. So, Mitch, um, if we can move to that, we'll do that for about five minutes and then come back and wrap up with sort of general questions. So you, you, you uh, heard Mickey and Russ talk about these uh, four areas of impact, student voice, self-worth, engagement, um, and purpose. And uh, this is really your chance to then say, well, where have you observed this uh, and, and pair up with another person? If you don't pair up with another person, uh, maybe you can enter some comments into the IM box. And uh, we'll bring um, Mickey or Russ back up here. In about two minutes, I'll bring myself down, and in about two minutes, we'll bring one of them back up. Okay, Mickey, you're back up. Great. Mickey? So okay. let me, uh, okay. yep. Yep. And I'll bring the slides back up And we also. can bring Russ back, too. Oh, I'll bring Russ back up. Actually, we okay. don't need the slides anymore. Yeah, bring okay. Russ back up. Yeah. All right. Um, so uh, put in the chat box there uh, something you just learned. I know it was short. It was brief. But um, a lot of the questions we received actually were, um, that's why I keep, I don't know if you know, I keep looking to my right here. I have a looking at. Uh, the Twitter feed, also um, uh, some of the questions that were asked uh, as people came in you know, to start. Yeah. So put those best practices that you heard or if you didn't get a chance to talk to anybody that you know of around student voice, around self-worth, engagement, and purpose. And what we know is, based on the data that Russ and I, and I just shared, that if you were to do something to, in your school tomorrow, in your classroom or in your school tomorrow, you would have those effect sizes on your kids. It's not rocket science in a sense. It's pretty straightforward. Um, develop those four things in your students and they will respond with academic motivation among other things. Um, so Russ, you want to see uh, if we want to take on some of the questions that were asked ahead of time or people can continue to ask questions in the in the chat window here which I can see. Uh, yeah, 
We can do the chat. What do we want to do? Yeah. So a lot of the questions were about practicalities, like the how-to questions. How do I do this in my classroom? Um, obviously, uh, and, and Russ, maybe you can speak to the surveys are just a starting point. So we, we shared survey data, and, and it's good to have that data and do surveys. We always fall with focus groups, but even beyond that, um, student voice is not about giving a survey. Um, so you want to say more about that, maybe? Because I know that's a soapbox for you. Yeah. <laughs> and I'll, I know I'll that pull out the soapbox. Yeah. <laughs> it is, yeah. Soapboxes are good. Oh, God. Mickey says that's because I have many soapboxes I can stand on, uh, and usually do multiple times during the day. The um, Here's the interesting thing about the to-do next piece, and this isn't trying to avoid the question because it's critical, and, it, and it's what this work is about. When I'm looking at the, the how-to, and I know Mickey and and everyone else on staff gets this question too. The how-to for me is taking a step back and, and not do how-to from my perspective, but what can we do best together? And by that is, remember that first, the third, number three on our fundamental beliefs, is going back to the students and ask them what would make a difference for them, and then how are they gonna accept responsibility for it? So, and some of it's not rocket science. So for example, self-worth. Uh, when we went back to, we, we're trying developing all sorts of things, and we have activity books and those kinds of things, and they're all fine and dandy. But it's asking the students what would create the sense of self worth without asking them self worth, because they'll just kind of blow their heads a little bit. But say, how do we make you feel more connected to this classroom? And the kids' words, not ours, is say hi to us by our name. Yeah, put this Mick with a book. But say hi to us by our name. Um, it's that simple. Uh, another one that is so easy about building self-worth, ask a kid how they're doing and wait for a response. It's kind of a novel thought in our American culture, um, but it's not so uh, taken for granted for kids. When you, if you ask somebody tomorrow how they're doing and wait for a response, I will promise you they will give you a double take. I'm like, what? What? You mean you, you want to know? Um, I, we talk about teachers that want to create better relationships with the kids, um, and they say, well, I've got so many kids in my school, I can't do it, I have like, 150 kids a day. I'm like, well, have lunch in the cafeteria, not every day, because you could die if you did that, but have lunch in the cafeteria maybe w once a month. Um, mm -hmm. Just grab a tray and, and sit in there with somebody. Um, I'll tell you, by doing that, they're going to think you're a great teacher. You could be a crap teacher, quite frankly, um, but showing this notion like, I'm going to eat with the kids. I, let's, I don't even care what you talk about. But just show that you're real to them and being genuine. That, to me, that's a self-worth piece. Regarding engagement and purpose, quite frankly, it's simply asking kids what their hopes and dreams are. Um, it, it's hard to get teach something to somebody that you don't know anything about them regarding where they want to go in the future. So I think there's lots of how-tos that are pretty much common sense, but sometimes common sense, as our friend Ray McNulty out of Southern New Hampshire University says, Common sense gets trumped by common practice. I think the work that Mickey and myself and the rest of the team does at the Institute is to get people back to a common sense. Self-worth, engagement, and purpose is not rocket science. It's common sense that gets overlooked. We have this huge tendency in education to overcomplicate things, to overcomplicate solutions. And why? Well, it's easy why we do that. It's, be it's because we can. Um, and I'm just telling people to take a step back and, you know, realize, take a solid step back. This is what I do. It's why I do it. And this is how I can make a difference. Um, and by having those conversations with kids, you're going to come up with more solutions than you'll know what to do with. And you know what? The solutions won't be on you. They're going to be on your students. Uh, Mitch is just asking, can you hear us? I can hear you. So I hope everybody else can hear you. I hope it's just not the two of us having a conversation. <laughs> Not that that's not that that's a bad thing, but we could talk any time. Um, yeah, mention, I, Mickey, I, that was a brilliant answer. Yeah, I, I mean, I, obviously, I agree with you about about common sense uh, and and just doing what makes sense to do um, at at other levels, at deeper levels. And again, we have seen this. Um, here comes Mitch back. We have seen this. Um, Schools do start to put students on building leadership teams or school improvement teams or hiring teams. So if, you, if you're going to hire a new teacher or a new principal even, uh, get kids on those teams. Um, we, we're <laughs> Dr. Baca is outside his office wondering what the hell I'm doing. Okay, I'm, 
Uh, I think I'm back. Okay, so I don't know what happened there, but um, Mitch was trying to get up. I think I must have said something, or you told him to kick me out or something. Uh, so, uh, so I was just saying, at, at, at deeper level, some of the practical things that happen are, are kids start to get on teams where important decisions are being made. Give kids a seat at the table where meaningful decisions are made. And what happens is we've seen it happen. A principal we work with in Ohio put kids on a building leadership team, and the teachers' union grieved it. Somebody on that team, teacher, grieved it, and the, the principal said, bring it. We'll let, we'll let this go out through the process. And eventually what happened is that building leadership team, which is an elementary school, became more effective for having student voice. That The students on that team were helping them solve problems uh, from, from the student point of view that would have been unsolvable without student voice there. And the t other teachers on that committee began to put peer pressure on the student who had brought the, on the teacher who had brought the grievance to back off, that this was working, that there was really no reason, this wasn't a change of working environment or anything like that, and eventually that teacher dropped the grievance. So you have to be bold, you have to be brave, and you have to pull out that seat wherever you have decision-making authority to do it, classroom, school, district, if you're a superintendent, pull out that seat at the table where meaningful decisions are made and invite a student to sit in it. Um, and then Perfect. as Russ started with, listen, learn, and lead with those kids. All right, Nick, that's a perfect way to end. And it is just hitting 4.30, and the longest hour of my life is about up now. The, <laughs> the, Wait, uh, make it better for um, you. Hold on. <laughs> it's just perfect. Now we can end. All right. So, Nick, thank you for joining this. I thank my staff for not dropping this halfway through this call, because trust me, I have been tracking you. The, um, but thanks, thanks, Mick and Mitch for, for, for making this all happen, and certainly to Colin for believing in us, quite frankly, as, as much as we believe in ourselves, and that, that's saying a lot. So on behalf of Mickey, my team at the Quality Institute, Corwin, uh, Mitch and Shindig, and everyone that stayed on for this incredibly engaging hour, um, thank you. And if I could give you a certificate, I would. Um, so if you send me a certificate that you want me to sign, I'll sign it. Um, all right, you guys take care. Thanks so much. Thanks, Mitch. Here comes Mitch back up. Actually, so I, so I, yeah, so I want to say, um, actually, Corwin will send everybody a certificate, so you don't have to. Okay, so there. And then, um, and then I changed the website a little bit because you you volunteered. You, uh, next month, uh, you're going to be talking about ten things you always wanted to know about Donald Trump, right? <laughs> Hell yeah, baby. I'll tell you right now. No, I'll let's wait. Let's wait till next month. <laughs> okay, we'll wait till next month. Okay. So anyhow, I'll I'll I'll, I'll probably see you next month online. And uh, thank you again for for another. You guys are great. So uh, first of all, passion comes through. And you may not like webinars, but you're you know you when when you're on here, you know you emote how much you believe in kids, and it just it just comes through in in, in the events. So thank you very much, and uh, you. see you soon. And uh, this is Mitch Weisberg. I'm signing off for EdChat Interactive. Please join us for a future session at www.edchatinteractive.org. And uh, we have a few sessions coming up next week. I hope to see you all next week. Take care.